Hey guys, what's up? IPA is one of the most important things to understand if you want to understand linguistics. It's also super helpful if you're trying to learn a new language. There's just something critical about being able to read how anything sounds in any language, which is why I already made a video about it five and a half years ago as my third YouTube video ever, but slight problem. It sucked. Like, there's a fairly large amount of errors in that video, mostly just because I had limited experience with IPA up to that point and was still in high school. But now that I've been through college and actually have the confidence that I know enough to explain IPA, I owe it to y'all to give an updated version of that past video with, you know, correct information. Let's go. First off, what's this IPA I've been talking about and where did it come from? And in case you haven't figured it out yet, I'm not talking about beer. Basically, IPA, which stands for International Phonetic Alphabet, is a very large alphabet used to indicate what specific sounds are in a given word or phrase, and it can be used for any language. Without it, to describe a sound, you'd have to go into an insane amount of detail that people won't understand anyway. IPA was created originally in 1888 by French linguist Paul Passy, with collaboration from Danish linguist Otto Jespersen and English phoneticians Alexander John Ellis and Henry Sweet, them among a group that would eventually be known as the International Phonetic Association, or... IPA, but Zidneff already pointed out that irony. The alphabet was originally serviceable only in English and French, but has since expanded to include every language that we know of. So how does IPA work? Well, since it aims to represent every language equally, it's more or less a version of the Latin alphabet where there's one character for every sound that's found in any language anywhere, and when IPA is written out, there's a one-to-one -one character to sound correspondence. A lot of the characters are instantly recognizable for what they are. However, some may deceive you depending on your first language because the linguists creating the charts often chose popular demand for the letter's sounds. The two main examples are how this symbol isn't r but r based on how most of the world reads it, and how this isn't j but y because of its consistent usage for y, especially in languages from Northern and Eastern Europe. Now, while I said this is a version of the Latin alphabet, it does look pretty weird. In order to cover all the sounds, some letters get notches added, some letters get flipped over, and occasionally there will be some non-Latin characters like th and ch from Greek, since we're not limited by printing presses and typewriters anymore. And finally, since languages are often not that simple, there are also smaller appendages that go on the letters called supersegmentals, which is also the name of the features they represent, and we'll talk about the specifics of those after the vowel and consonant sections respectively. But before that, we also gotta address the slashes and brackets that go around any Anything written in IPA. These make up a code of their own, and it requires a bit of linguistics to understand, specifically phonemes versus allophones. Basically, a phoneme is a sound that makes up a unit of speech how it's envisioned in the head of a native speaker, but this isn't always how it actually gets pronounced. Sometimes a phoneme will get pronounced differently depending on where it is in the word, according to a certain pattern, and this is known as an allophone. Therefore, if you're transcribing something in IPA, you have a choice on how you write it. If you want to write how a speaker would actually say the words, you use brackets, and this is called narrow transcription. But if you want to instead write what a speaker thinks they're saying, i.e. the phonemes in the word, you use slashes, and this is called broad transcription. I usually prefer narrow transcription, but both of them have their uses, especially if you want to teach sounds in a new language to students. To exemplify this, here's a pet peeve I have. In American English, there's an allophone where O and U become O and U before liquid consonants. For example, phone versus hole and tune versus pool, L's a liquid. So here's how you'd write those words in narrow and broad transcription. The problem is that people just ignore this allophonic distinction all the time when writing IPA transcriptions, which means that if I hypothetically was an English student reading those transcriptions, I wouldn't be able to see that allophone and I'd stay pronouncing those vowels, namely the phonemes, wrong as phon and tun. So yeah, American linguists fix that. But yeah, last two things to know about narrow and broad transcription. First, broad transcription may allow you to use a more common character for a sound, provided there's no phonemic difference between the sound in the language and the sound normally represented by that symbol. Like, in English, you could use right side up R to represent R, since we don't also have R. And lastly, narrow transcription doesn't have to be that narrow. You don't need to put every painstaking detail in the transcription, or it'd get hard to read after a certain point. Like how you don't necessarily need to put the dental sign under T or D in Spanish, even though they are are dental consonants. Now it's time for the charts, and I'll start with the vowels since the chart is easier to understand. Here's the chart, and it's basically designed to look like a person's mouth when they face the left, and the various positions on the chart represent where the tongue is when making the vowel sound. The linguistic jargony names of vowels are formed with three words in a specific order, followed by the word vowel. The first of these words is the height of the tongue during the vowel, ranked from close, like e and u, to open, like a and a. Between that, there's also close mid, like e and o, mid, like a, uh, and open mid, like e and a. The second word in a vowel's name is its backness, or how far back the tongue is. There are basically three columns here. Front, like e and a, central, like e and u, and back, like u and o. And the third part of a vowel's name is either the word rounded or unrounded, which is just, you know, if the lips are rounded during the vowel. When you see two vowels on the chart in the same position, the one on the left is unrounded and the one on the right is rounded, like with a versus e. 
It should be mentioned that there's a very strong tendency for front vowels to be unrounded and back vowels to be rounded, as it makes their distinctions clearer, especially in languages with fewer vowels. But in addition to those three attributes, there's also tense versus lax. The difference here is in, well, tenseness, that being, if your tongue goes all the way to the indicated position, tense, or just kind of stays close to the center, lax. Normally, you don't need to explicitly say tense since they're far more common, but you do need to say lax when applicable. Such differences are tense e versus lax i, tense a versus lax a, and tense u versus lax u, which is not the vowel in book, so stop commenting that. At least not in American English, which is what I speak. It's accurate in British and Australian English, though. So now that we've seen the vowel characters, it's time for the vowel diacritics in IPA. To stay on theme, I'll start with those that slightly reposition the vowel. These are normally omitted due to languages not having any distinctions involving them, but first up are the tacks, which go under the letter and have a system to them. To start, the up tack slightly raises the vowel, and the down tack slightly lowers the vowel, so they work kind of like arrows. For example, there's a, a, and e. This last one, the mid-front unrounded vowel e, despite not having an IPA letter of its own, is actually pretty common, especially for languages without a phonemic a, a distinction. It normally just gets written without the tack, though. The left and right tacks indicate similar things. Remember that on the chart, left equals front of the mouth. But more specifically, they indicate respectively advanced and retracted tongue root, which is exactly what it sounds like. The tongue root is either advanced or retracted, and this is a distinction some languages have. By the way, these symbols can also be used for consonants if applicable. Similar to the tax, a plus sign below the letter, or above if the letter sinks below the line, means that the whole tongue is advanced, while a macron, which is basically a minus sign, means that the whole tongue is retracted. Contrary to everything above, you can centralize a vowel by adding either a diaresis or a miniature x above the letter. And finally, for the relative positioning signs that you'll likely never use, a right half ring under the vowel indicates that it's more rounded, and a left half ring indicates less rounding. So now onto the vowel diacritics that you're more likely to use as they represent supersegmental features, starting with vowel length. Long vowels are represented by a colon made of miniature triangles, of which you'd only use the top triangle if the vowel is half long. To the other end, some languages have extra short vowels, and those are represented with a breve. Regular just short vowels don't get any special treatment in IPA. Now to go through some other vowel features. The tilde above indicates a nasal vowel, like eh. The tilde below indicates creaky voice, like eh. And the diarsis below indicates breathy voice, like eh. Also, in diphthongs, the vowel that isn't the main part of the syllable will get an inverted breathe below it, like an I. Now about pitch and tone. There are two ways pitch and tone can be expressed in IPA. First is with a diacritic, namely, acute for high, a, eh, grave for low, a, eh, Karen for rising, a, eh, literally low to high, and circumflex for falling, a, eh, literally high to low. You can technically extrapolate further tones with this system, but if you're dealing with a complicated system of contour tones like those of the Chinese languages, you're better off using the other system, stick figures. Basically, you put these sticks after the vowel and use the relative height of the lines attached to them to determine the tone. Pitch accent can also be represented with a superscript arrow after the affected syllable, upwards for high pitch and downwards for low pitch, although I've only ever seen this done in Japanese. And finally, for vowel diacritics, the stress is indicated by a vertical line before the affected syllable, superscript for primary stress and subscript for secondary stress. So now I've arrived at the consonant chart, and it's a bit more complicated than that of the vowels, but the consonant's names also have three parts. I'll start by explaining the first part, which corresponds to whether a consonant is in the left or right of its box. This is the voicing, and the first word of a consonant's name will be either voiceless on the left or voiced on the right. This basically just refers to if your vocal cords are vibrating during the consonant or not. Hear the difference between s and z. Other such examples are p and b, ch and r, and ge and ge. The second word in a consonant's name is its anatomy, or place of articulation, that is, which part of the mouth is used to make the sound. More specifically, the name mostly refers to the passive articulator. You see, consonants are made with two parts, the active articulator and the passive articulator, which are both exactly what they sound like. The active articulator reaches up and somehow contacts the passive articulator, which basically just stands there. The thing is, there are only four active articulators, and each of them has several passive articulators assigned to them, so just saying the passive articulator is more concise. The places of articulation are listed across the top of the consonant chart and represent the columns, and the directionality is the same as on the vowel chart. The front of the mouth is on the left. So now I'll just run through the places of articulation in order of front to back, which means we're starting with bilabial. This one's pretty self-explanatory. It's made with both lips, and some examples are ma, ba, and pa. After that is labia dental, which involves the lower lip and upper teeth. The most common sounds of this variety are fa, ve, and re. There are also some dentolabial sounds made instead with the lower teeth and upper lip, but these are harder to make and way less common. They're followed by another rare place of articulation, lingua labial, which involves the tongue going between the lips. These sounds like p, v, and n are found exclusively in a few languages from Vanuatu, along with one singular language from Guinea-Bissau. Now back to the more common places of articulation, we have dental, which puts the tongue between the teeth. 
This is the case with the and the, for example, but a lot of languages have their the, the, and na sounds technically falling into this category. Otherwise, you'll find those sounds in the next place of articulation, alveolar, which is produced with the tip of the tongue on the alveolar ridge, the ridge behind the teeth. Some examples are, of course, the, the, and na, but there's also se, ze, re, and le. Logically behind alveolar, you'll find post-alveolar, which is pretty self-explanatory. The main examples there are sh, z, ch, and j. Then, kind of going along with this is retroflex, which is kind of like post-alveolar, but the tip of the tongue is curled back, so the underside touches the roof of the mouth. And these sounds are very common in India. They include t, d, l, n, and sh. The next step back brings us to alveolar palatal, which basically describes the tongue being between the alveolar ridge and the palate, basically the hard part at the top of the mouth, most famously having sh and j. Behind that is, of of course, palatal. The most widespread sound of this place is ye, but there's also nye, kye, sh, j, and lye. Following that is velar, where the body of the tongue contacts the velum, which is the back part of the roof of the mouth. These sounds are relatively common, and they include k, g, ng, and ch. Then behind that is uvular. The uvula is the soft part at the back of the mouth with the dangly bit. It makes sounds such as ga, ga, ch, and ra. Now the last two places of articulation are fully in the throat, not really in the mouth at all, and the first of those is pharyngeal, sometimes called epiglottal. The pharynx is a tube leading from the nose past the mouth down to the esophagus and trachea, also known as the windpipe, while the epiglottis is the flap responsible for closing off your windpipe to stuff that isn't air. Both of those body parts contribute to making these sounds, the main two of which are the two most quickly thought of Arabic consonants, H and the R. And finally, for the place of articulation, there's glottal, which is just the vocal cords, or glottis. This includes H, H, and E. So now we're at the final word of a consonant's name, and that's the manner of articulation, or how exactly the sound is made. If you don't get it, you'll get it very soon. Unlike with the place of articulation, with the manner, there's no natural order for them to go in, so I'm just going to present them in the order used on the IPA Phonetics app, which is the main IPA tool I use. I should also mention that all consonants fall into either obstruents, those which obstruct airflow, and sonorants, those that don't, and they're not necessarily together on the chart. The first manner of articulation is the plosives, also sometimes called stop consonants. This is the most obstruent of the obstruent classes, as the airflow is completely stopped, and the involved parts of the mouth kind of explode off each other, hence the name. The six best known plosives are the next manner down is the nasals, a sonorant class where some of the sound comes out through the nose. Examples of these are m, n, 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 and n. After that, we have the trills, sonorants, which are exactly what they sound like, except they're more like drum rolls than trills on a flute. The most common one by far is r, but there's also dr and r. The next manner is what would happen if you did a trill only once, a tap or flap. The only one I've ever heard in real life is the rather common r. After that, we're back into the obstruents with the fricatives. As their name implies, fricatives are made using friction between the articulators. They're arguably the most versatile manner of articulation, and some of them include f, v, th, v, s, z, sh, j, ch, g, ch, r, h, r, h, and h. Along with that, there are also some lateral fricatives, which are basically just fricatives, but the air comes out on either side of the tongue, not directly over it. The main two of these are sh and j. After that, we have the approximants, a sonoring class where the active articulator goes near the passive articulator but doesn't touch, hence the name approximants. They're also sometimes called liquids or semivowels since they're pretty close to being vowels and some of them are w, v, r, and y. And much like with the fricatives, there are also lateral approximants or approximants where the air comes out beside the tongue. The main one is l, but there's also l and y. By the way, about le, it can also have variants with increased tongue pressure in the back of the mouth, and these are called dark L's. They can be represented with this character, but often IPA writers don't distinguish between it and normal light L, so if you're learning a language, it's probably best to listen and figure this out on your own. Moving on, we have the affricates, an obstruent class that's basically just a plosive and fricative co-articulated. They include t, ch, j, and k. There are also lateral affricates, which is just k and j, pretty much. So now that's the end of the so-called pulmonic consonants, those that use the the lungs, it's time to look at the non-pulmonic consonants, three groups of rather interesting consonants that, you know, don't use the lungs. First up are the implosives, which are basically plosives, but your throat goes down and draws some air inwards just before the release, hence why they're called implosive. Disclaimer, to this point I haven't studied any languages that use implosives, but I'll try nonetheless. Four of them are buh, 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 and buh. Next up are the ejectives, which are kind of the opposite of the implosives in that the glottis goes upwards when releasing the sound. I actually have studied a language that uses ejectives, that being Amharic, so I can say that some of them are p, t, ch, and k. And finally, we have arguably the most famous non-pulmonic consonants, the clicks. Clicks are made by closing the mouth off at multiple points, creating an air pocket that then sort of explodes when you release the sound, which is why they're so loud. For example, uh, 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 or, uh, sorry, Addy, you hear me doing that.
So now as we near the end of the video, the last thing to really teach about is IPA consonant diacritics, and since we've already talked about voicing, I'll start with those two marks. The ring below is the voiceless marker, and the Karen below is the voiced marker. But now you may be asking, since IPA characters already indicate if they're voiced, why would these diacritics even be necessary? Two reasons. First, voiceless sonorants are pretty rare in the world, so they don't have their own characters in IPA, but they still exist, so when needed, they're written as the regular voice sonorant, but with the ring under them. For example, in the Icelandic words reiten, hlepa, and nappur. The second reason is that, in addition to being voiceless or voiced, obstruents also tend to be harsher when voiceless and softer when voiced. This correlation is almost universal, but sometimes an IPA transcriber may really want it to be clear that a voiceless obstruent is softer than normal, and in that case, they would use the appropriate voiced consonant, but put a ring below it. This is done a lot in Danish, for example in strand, where the T represents a sound that's indisputably voiceless, but a lot less harsh than some other T sounds found in Danish. I've actually never seen the Karen used for voice by anyone else before, although I used to put it under glottal stops to represent when a voice plosive was articulated but not produced in English. Good thing I eventually learned our next diacritic, the left angle, which is specifically used in that situation. Articulated but not produced, by the way, it means that the tongue moves to a position like you're about to say the consonant, but a glottal stop comes out instead. It's a rather apparent feature of English, and I strongly prefer the left angle over the glottal stop character because it allows me to actually show the phoneme, which optionally can be said, especially in more careful speech. Now about the diacritics that slightly reposition a consonant. All the tacks and whatnot from the vowels can be used for consonants too, but the consonants do have some extra signs of their own. In the section on place of articulation, you saw two of them, the seagull, yes, that's what it's called, to indicate a lingual labial consonant, and the bridge to indicate a dental consonant. But there are also two others you may come across, which mainly apply to alveolar consonants. The inverted bridge indicates an apical consonant, meaning the tip of the tongue is used, in contrast with the square, which represents a laminal consonant, one made with the blade of the tongue. Here's a sketch to tell the difference. Next up, a vertical line below the consonant means that it's syllabic, like in American English bird or Serbian trn. This can only happen to sonorants. And after that, we have the superscript letters indicating rather important suprasegmental features. An H indicates aspiration like in T, although for voiced aspiration or breathy consonants, the curvy voiced version is used instead like in D. Outside of that, the J indicates palatalization like T. The W indicates labialization like T. The superscript gamma indicates velarization, a feature found in Irish, like th. And the superscript backwards question mark without the dot indicates pharyngealization, a feature found in Arabic, like th. Sometimes the superscripts can also go before a consonant, like the H for pre-aspiration, a feature found in Icelandic, like in trikir. While any superscript nasal consonant can be used for prenasalization, a feature found in many African languages, and that sounds like mb or nd. Finally, for the consonant diacritics, we have the double breves, or ties as I like to call them. A double tie can go above two consonants to indicate co-articulation either as an affricate or otherwise, like in that uh, phoneme found in several African languages like Igbo. And a double brief can also be put below the space between two words to indicate raison, or that the normally silent consonant is pronounced at the beginning of the following word due to a vowel. Here's a video about French if you need more explanation about that. So now to close out the video, I'll just explain why knowing IPA is valuable as a language learner. Whenever I learn a new language, I start by learning how to read it since I'm largely a text learner and I can't do anything with the language unless I know how the words are pronounced. No matter what source you use for this, they're gonna use IPA to tell you exactly how any letter or letter combination is pronounced, although audio examples clearly make it easier to get the ins and outs of the phoneme. What I do is, I go to the page of the script of my target language on Omniglot to see how each letter is pronounced, and if there's an IPA symbol that I don't know, then I go to the IPA phonetics app, find that symbol, and click on it. And it'll play both the audio of that sound and a video showing a mouth saying it. In addition to this, if you've ever been on Wikipedia, you'll know there's some really technical stuff in every article on there, including the ones about languages. Whether they're talking about sound shifts, listing the phonemes used by a language, or even just showing how to pronounce someone's name in the intro, there will be IPA there that would be useful to know. Now back to language learning, you should definitely listen to samples in your target language to catch the features that often get overlooked in IPA, like slight vowel repositioning or dark L's. But just the fact that IPA takes the guesswork out of pronunciation saves so much time. Thanks for watching.